guidance to the facility designers so that they won't put in stuff that clobbers our backup radio systems. In Alachua County, we had an EOC, we were operating out of it. We had so much noise, you couldn't make any connection to anybody below 20 meters. And at 20 meters, you were doubtful. And we finally solved every bit of that, and we actually can run contests from our EOC despite all of the noise. But we had to move our antennas 100 yards practically away from the buildings, maybe 75 yards, to make that work. They're building a new EOC. So I said, please don't make the same mistakes that you made on the first one. So my question was, how can I give them guidance that is believable, authoritative, and actually says, if you do this, we think it's going to work. And if you violate this, we're going to have a problem. So in order to do that, I had to learn one. So it's a dangerous world out there. And public switch telecommunications have a lot of vulnerabilities, not just to hurricanes, but also to malicious intent of hackers, state actors. So this week, last week, Putin said he would send, you know, he would unleash on London and Washington and New York if he didn't get his way in Ukraine and met the dev said they would use up their entire arsenal to blow up the free world if they didn't get what they wanted. Great. So now we got Iran building their stuff and they're busy shelling our ships through the Houthis. They set two British tankers on fire so far. One of them's already sunk. The other one I think is in the process. The price of insurance to go through that strait is now through the roof, and most of the world's oil is now having to go around South Africa. Dangerous world. Um, so the Florida Division of Emergency Management now uses federally provided shears frequencies, a log periodic antenna, it's beautiful, and a loop antenna for backup communications to Florida counties. The mail tutter has been using Invis and other communications for battlefield communications for a long time. They're highly dependent on satellites. And as we all know, the Russians are planning how to take out all the satellites with an EMP. HF has been the traditional backup for long range embassy communications. But a lot of this stuff um, didn't get the emphasis that it needed once we developed satellites. Meanwhile, the stockbrokers discovered that if you have to depend on satellites or landlines, it takes you milliseconds to execute a trade. And the quantitative algorithms, if they could get down to microseconds, you could make more money, like lots more money. So they did a study and built an experimental HF link and discovered their latency was way lower. And they put a request into the FCC have spread spectrum, broad, powerful, crappy transmitters all up and down the RF spectrum so they can make billions more dollars. And thankfully, uh, I and the Ada Boreal and many other people pointed out their requirements were, were pitiful compared with what home builders are, are required to provide. And their need did not serve the public interest. And it was guaranteed that their sidebands would destroy ham radio communications as well as a bunch of other stuff. But people are beginning to realize that HF communications are an infrastructure-free way of communicating. And although they're variable in the ionosphere and things like that, they provide ways to communicate when other stuff quits. So the Iowa Direco, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, I think that's the right city, everything was blown away. They lost their internet, they lost their power, they lost their transmitting antennas, and they even lost their backup antennas because the end connector center pin pulled out when the cable stretched because of the 60, 80, 90 mile an hour winds. So they had nothing. So whatever is the capital of Iowa, well, we haven't had any reports of injuries whatsoever in Cedar Rapids, so don't send them any help. That's literally what happened. They had to send a car. By the way, our city is destroyed. <laughs> 
We, have, we don't even have the ability to tell you we're in trouble. So you need to have HF. And you need to have HF that's reliable. You gotta understand there's a reason why ham radio operators like PL 259s, even though they're crappy. Okay. We operate in about a 120 dB path budget between what our receivers can do and what our transmitters can put out. And we need all of it because we got losses just for filling the space. We got losses in the ionosphere. We got losses everywhere. So yeah, there are days when the incoming signals are 40 dB over S9, but there are other days when they're 3 dB above the noise. Or if you're doing MTA, 10 dB below the noise. And if you add 10 more dB of noise, you can really disrupt HF communications. So that's a bad thing to do. So this is a chart that, okay, well, where are this? Can you see that one? Yes, you can. Um, that is 80 meters, and the red line is a noisy house environment, and the green line is quiet rural. And this is 10 megahertz. We don't have any values of seven. I don't know why. And one of these is I think that's 20 meters right there. This data comes from the International Telecommunications Union, and also from the Radio Society of Great Britain. And it's measured and predicted values of baseline noise that's, you can't change it. It comes from the ionosphere, from the cosmic sources. And then there's always radio stuff around us that's creating noise, uh, cars and everything else going past us. The units that they use for this are not what ham radio operators are used to. The units are dB microvolts per meter. It's not S9 or 10 dB over. It's a field strength measurement of the E field. Remember, an electromagnetic wave has an E field and an H field, and it's typically, they're, they're related by Ohm's law, and there are specific numbers for space, epsilon zero and mu zero. The impedance of space is about 377 ohms <coughs> in terms of E and H fields. But the way that professionals talk about it is in E field strength, not in receiver voltage input. So if you want to speak their language, I believe you're going to have to do this. So the FCC and the Europeans, through CISPR standards, have measurements of radiated noise above 30 megahertz. But below 30 megahertz, they have no limits on radiated noise. What they have a limit on is conductive noise through the wiring that connects to a device on their desk. So at first, I couldn't figure out why. Radiated noise is what kills me. Well, why are you not limiting radiated noise? Okay, here's the reason. Conventional wisdom is if the antenna is not at least a sixth of a wavelength, it's pretty inefficient. A sixth of a wavelength at 30, at, uh, 30 megahertz is around a meter and a half. For lo lower frequencies, it's even longer. So the, the radiator of a commercially produced device is not its power cord. It is the wiring of the building it is connected to. And so nobody can predict it because you don't know what building and how it was wired that they're gonna connect this thingamajigger that you just bought and plugged into the wall output in your EOC or had affixed to your power system that runs all your uninterruptible power for your EOC. Nobody can tell you what it's going to be. So the FCC, instead of having a radiated limit below 30 megahertz, has a conductive limit. So your UPS or your television or computer or power supply can only have a certain amount of conductive noise because we know you're going to connect it to the whole building. And we assume that's going to be a fairly efficient radiator. So by sort of figuring out what the impedance of the building is likely to be and what the transmitting efficiency is going to be, they actually came up apparently with a conductive limit. But I could find no studies 
documenting that it was the right way. I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find the justification for it. It must exist, it's just not on the internet that I could find. It's probably in a book somewhere. So here are the limits. <clears throat> now, because this is a conducted limit, it can be specified in either current or voltage, but it's easier in voltage. And there are class A and class B devices. Class A devices are intended for commercial use and they're allowed to be noisier. Class B devices are intended for residential and they're required to be a little quieter. These measurements are in dB microvolt. So that's 20 log the voltage per microvolt. So for class A, you can be 60 dB microvolts, which I think would turn into a millivolt if you do the math. And for class B, you have to be down to 46 dB microvolts from 0.5 to 5, and you can go up to 50 uh, micro dB microvolts from 5 to 30 amperes. So those are the FCC limits, and it's in part 15. And these are the limits for <coughs> incidental radiators, things that are not supposed to radiate but do. So I mentioned in Latcher County, our existing EOC is a disaster for RF design because it's got enormous noise. It's got like 20 to 40 dB more noise just walking around the building than my house. We, we measured the noise on their ground straps, three inch wide ground straps crisscross underneath the whole building. Enormous noise on the ground straps. We measured the noise <clears throat> When we open the trap door to get to the roof where the antennas are, enormous noise, 40 dB more noise than my house. So if they repeat that, we'll be in a hell of a mess. So I need to advise them how to avoid that. So here's how we did this. We tested a, a generator that makes electrical energy and is not supposed to be a radio transmitter. And the manufacturer says it meets class B limits. Now, I can't tell if it did or not. It doesn't in my tests, but you'll see why that's you know, different from their tests. Now, we have a lot of experience with that particular generator. We've used it in a lot of field days, a lot of deployments. And if you want to operate HF, you got to put a honking filter on that thing. And this is the filtering common mode filtering almost 100 dB of common mode to make that thing quiet down. The filter cost $123. That's despite its supposed class B rating. So we know this thing is noisy. So then the question is, how does the FCC do this measurement? But it turns out <clears throat> that the FCC does this in a rather unique way they require you to have a line isolation stabilization network to run any of these tests. And the way this works is, <clears throat> it's designed for a device that needs power, like a TV. So your power comes in here, and you simulate a load, an RF load, that is supposed to make the power quiet. So here's a resistor, five ohms, and a big capacitor, and an RF looks like a dead short. So the idea is this will quiet down any noise that comes in from the outside world. Now you connect your device that you're gonna test on this jack and you isolate it from the outside world with 50 microhenry chokes. So it doesn't even see the outside world and any noise from the outside world that escaped the microfarads gets killed by the 50 microhenries. So if there's noise on these power lines, it came from your device under test. Well, how do you measure that? Well, they put a big capacitor <coughs> to a, uh, a jack <coughs> and you connect your spectrum analyzer there and you measure the RF. Did you notice you're connecting it to a 120 volt AC line? This is not good for the health of a spectrum analyzer. So here's the problem. Even though you've got these capacitors and they're not great at 60 hertz, they're kind of high in dB. 
all power has harmonics. So it's got 120, 240, 48, it's got all these harmonics, right? And those are gonna have significant energy. And the lower harmonics are gonna be enough to drive your spectrum analyzer, either blow the bits out of the front end, or overload the AV converters, or both. So commercial listens, line isolation stabilization networks, typically have a 10 dB attenuator built in, and if you read articles on these things, they recommend that you put a high pass filter in them so that you don't look at the very lowest harmonics, which are quite powerful. So I didn't do the 10 dB filter, I did it with BNC connectors on the output, but I did do the high pass filter, so I got a 21 microfarad Michael Henry choke here in parallel, and I feed this thing with a 0.01 and a 0.01 to ground, so I ground isolate it, because I was very worried about ground loops, if I had differing grounds between my systems, and I didn't want to blow up anything. If you look at that, it's a 500 kilohertz 3 dB point, so I can't see stuff below 500 kilohertz, but I don't care about stuff below 500 kilohertz anyway. Um, and that was designed to protect my spectrum analyzer. Before I did that, I had almost no dynamic range because I had to put oodles and oodles and oodles of pads, attenuators, in line before my spectrum analyzer would come out of ADC overload mode. I didn't blow the front end up, I was just smart enough not to do that. <coughs> Adding the high pass filter is all of a sudden I can actually measure that. Now, I already explained to you what these things are, and you can buy them commercially. Everybody will be happy to sell them to you. Used, they run around three grand. <laughs> New, I'm not really sure. But I'm not paying three grand for a used listen. Now, it turns out a friend of mine had one, and he loaned it to me. But since I didn't know that, I built one. <clears throat> so this is a listen. So, I got two sides and I can power it from either side and everything's done with spade connectors so in this case it's rigged to get power from the generator but if I were testing a TV the power would be on this side and the TV would be on this side and I'd have outlets here to power it but since I'm running a generator it provides the power and I don't need to do anything else. It's got the 250 microhenry inductors it's got the eight microfarad capacitors, it's got the 50 or five ohm loads, and it's got a handy dandy circuit to give me a BNC output. So for 20 bucks, I managed to build a listen. So I didn't have to buy one. So I kind of told you how it worked. I still had to use a lot of 50 ohm pad attenuators on the output, like 30 to 50 dB of them. And my measurement standard is 3.57, 10.1, and if I can do it, 14 megahertz. And I just measured the noise there. I use a 10 kilohertz bandwidth. It's very important to specify the bandwidth because noise is generally white. So the wider the bandwidth, the bigger the value you're gonna read. So all noise has to be standardized to a bandwidth. Now, I can't do the right bandwidth. The correct bandwidth that's used in all the international standards is nine kilohertz. But I have only a thousand dollar spectrum analyzer and it won't do nine kilohertz. But there's a little math adjustment of about, oh, a fraction of a dB if you need to correct it. It's not worth worrying about. 10 kilohertz is good enough. <clears throat> now, how do you tell if a listen is actually any good? Well, one of the ways you tell is you measure the SWR that the device sees. <coughs> the device should see 50 ohms because it should be connected by capacitors to the input of the spectrum analyzer, which is 50 ohms. So if it sees 50 ohms, you've got the right load for your device under test. Now you could also study whether or not your pass band is what you think it is, but I didn't do that. But I did measure the SWR, so I literally connected up an MFJ 259 SWR meter to the input of that thing and put a 50 ohm load where the spectrum analyzer would be and I measured the SWR and it's pretty good. Now, the way that the FCC and the CISPR standards do this is different than what I do. They put the device on a table that's 80 centimeters above the ground 
They put a ground plane underneath it on the ground that's a certain dimension, and the device only gets to see the ground through its ground cable. Well, that's designed to make the device look good because its ground has inductance in it. It's got this power cable that it's not the way we use generators. So the way I use generators is I put a ground wire on them, and that's what we did in our tests, and I put them on the ground. I don't put them on a table. So we did a little different. Now I gotta tell you about the radiated noise measurement because that's where my slides go, so I'll come back. So for the radiated noise measurements, and this is not the scale, but this is my house, and there's a dipole antenna that runs sort of parallel to the west side of my house and goes further north, and it has a 300 ohm transmission line, and it goes to a old-fashioned kilowatt rated matching manual device. And that's where I put my spectrum analyzer to measure the radiated noise. And then here's the generator outside the garage on the first floor, and the generator transfer switch that powers the house is in the workroom. So there's this enormous cable that goes over across to that, and then about half of the house gets power from the device under test the generator. So I provided a building. It's just one building, it's not infinite buildings, but it's one building and it allows me to test in my anecdotal situation how much radiated noise did I have. So the antenna is a non-resonant antenna about 100 feet long with a 300 ohm window line. <coughs> and I make the simplifying assumption, which is not totally accurate, that it is roughly a full-size antenna on each band. Well, for 80 meters it is. 40 meters is pretty close, and for 20 it's a little bit longer than it needs to be, but it's definitely not a short antenna. So it picks up RF. On each frequency, I manually tuned it for an SWR better than 1.5 to 1, and then I measured the receive energy at each one of these frequencies. I also measured the noise floor of my measurement system to make sure that I was actually measuring something. I measured the baseline noise at my house without the generator running, and then I measured the noise with the generator running. Okay, now here's where it gets complicated. My spectrum analyzer reads out in dB milliwatts, but that's not what RF people use. They use this field strength measurement, which is an E-field measurement, dB microvolts per meter of space. So how do you connect, convert between them? Well, it turns out <clears throat> that people have figured this out and you can read about it on Wikipedia. And there's this really cool thing called antenna factor. And antenna factor literally says, if you have this E field, add this antenna factor dB to it and you will get the dB voltage that you will get off that antenna. So it converts E field into voltage on a uh, real antenna. And the antenna factor is known to be 9.72 divided by the wave width times the square root of the gain of the antenna. It's an established fact. Well, because noise is isotropic, it comes from everywhere. It doesn't matter what your gain is. It's one. Because where you pick up more noise, there's a compensatory place where you pick up less. So the gain of a real full-size antenna is one for our purposes, and you can calculate the wavelength and you can calculate the antenna factor. Then you gotta deal with Ohm's law, because now you've got a voltage, but the spectrum analyzer measures power. So you have to run through this, uh, Ohm's <coughs> law, 50 ohms, and the square of the voltage. And you end up with this equation at the top. <coughs> The dB microvolts that you're really looking at is equal to 107 dB plus the dBm that your spectrum analyzer measures. And from that, you can get the dB microvolts per meter by converting through the antenna factor. So I ran through all this math just to be sure, but it's published in a lot of places and you can just look it up. The 107 dB is really like a weird number, but it accounts for the square and it accounts for the 50 ohms and the conversions from microvolts and all this kind of stuff. So it's really great. So here's what you do. Here's the antenna factor 
No, that's the conductive movement. I think I already told you that. Um, yeah, I skipped and didn't put it in the slide I wanted to put it. But I calculated the antenna factor for each frequency mm -hmm. for my 100 foot long antenna, presuming it was a full size dipole, which is a little bit of a stretch. And then I measured the SWR of my listen, and it turns out it's got a good SWR all the way up to 10 megahertz. It sort of, sort of begins to crap out after that, but it was good enough for my work. And here are my conductive noise measurements. This is conductive. So this is measured off the AC line. The noise floor at 3.5 megahertz was negative 60 dBm. The hot conductor was way louder at negative 18 dBm. The cold conductor was way louder at negative 18 dBm. At seven megahertz, things were a little better. <clears throat> we're about negative 29 at negative 28.9 dBm. And at 10 megahertz, it was better still, negative 41 dBm and negative 40 dBm. Now, do you remember the FCC specs? Well, you gotta convert this into dB microvolts. Uh, what is this? Okay, this is this is the plot of the uh, my camera. This is my noise floor for my conductive measurements. And blue and purple, one of them is the hot lead and the other is the cold lead. You're gonna have to measure both. And when you make this measurement, it is the algebraic sum of both the common mode and the differential mode noise. And it turns out the FCC does not distinguish between them. They don't give a separate spec for the common mode or differential, they just say noise. So this is an appropriate way to make the measurement. And it was pretty clear that it goes down to here and I'm still above my noise floor of my measurement system. So I have accurate measurements of conductive noise. <clears throat> but they're way over class B spec. Way over class B spec. So, <clears throat> when I compute the noise voltage, which is what FCC regulates for, not DBM, it's over the 60 dB class A limit by 29 dB, over the class B limit by 43 dB, over by 18, over by 28, over by 7, over by 17. Why? This thing's sold as reading class B. Well, yeah. I think it might read class B if it was new. Mine's six or eight years old. It's been abused badly by me. And if it was sitting on a table above a ground plane with its only connection being the power cord. But mine, I set on the ground. Since it's a common mode radiator to an in-fed antenna system known as my house, giving it a good ground connection makes it a better transmitter. You want a good ground connection on your in-fed antenna. Well, I laid it on the ground, so it's got capacitive coupling to the ground, and then I took a five-foot ground rod connector, and I ran it over to my lightning arrestor ground system, which has got ground rods everywhere, and I gave it a darn good ground. So I did everything I could to make this, this transmitter be a good transmitter, instead of making it be a crappy transmitter, like the FCC tests do. So I'm showing you what really happens. If you give this thing the ability to really crank out some RF, it will do it. And you'll get tons of RF on your power system in your house. <coughs> well, here's my received noise. Here's my analyzer noise floor. When I was powered by this, the utility, I'm above the noise floor. And you can calculate the background noise in, um, this should be dB microvolts per meter, I should put this point per meter on each one of them. When I turn on the generator, I go up by 40 dB. Huge noise, any of that is on this one, I went from negative 97 to negative 82, so I'm still up, eh, what about 15 dB more noise. And on this one, I'm up almost 20 dB. So um, I'm degraded by 38 dB on this one. 38 dB, that's like a 10 kilowatt transmitter. 
compared to a 201 watt rig to get through these to have a 38 dB noise. On this one, I'm degraded by 15 dB, so you just nearly need a kilowatt to get through to there. And on this one, I'm degraded by 18 dB. So these are horrible degradations. You, you just can't operate unless the guy's you know, in the same neighborhood with his kilowatt blasting at you, then you can talk to it. And this is a class B certified piece of device. So what this says is, if you buy equipment for your EOC that is class B certified, which is residential and supposed to be good, there is no guarantee that it will work. Instead, what you've got to do is actually measure it in the real situation and see what it really produces. And you can do that either this way, because it turns out that if you look at their specs, if the thing had actually met the spec, it would have been way better. In the real situation, if it met the spec, it turns out you're pretty close to being okay. You might have to be under the spec a few times, but um, it, it, in the real situation, the spec isn't far off from what you need. In my anecdotal situation at my house with my antenna, which is on the other side of the house from the wire, uh, but if you just believe the published stuff that they buy UPSs for your EOC, or you buy stuff for your house, believing it's class B certified, I've had people tell me that this or that inverter for this solar panels is class B certified, so it would be okay with their ham radio doing it. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. So <clears throat> you can measure it with the listen and measure the conducted noise, or you can just turn on a radio receiver and listen to the antenna and see if the noise fully went way up when you turn the sucker on. <coughs> so <clears throat> I've got a paper that I developed from this. It's a little bit more in depth with like 30 footnotes um, and that sort of a thing that I'm getting ready to submit to QEX based on this, but that was the basic gist of the whole thing. Question. Oh, you, you, I'm looking up what my generator is spec at now. <laughs> it, the specs are close to worthless. Oh, good. Unless you re do it in real life. They, because this one probably is class B certified. Have you done any work with the problem of solar panels? Yes. Um, I have put filters on my solar panels. And um, <laughs> I blew a few inverter MOSFETs. Um, so I'm not sure if I changed the load impedance for those switching transformers, but the, my solar panel installer was not happy with it. So I removed some of the filtering, um, but I did other things. I put ferrites various places, and my home solar panel system at my house in Florida is reasonably usable. Um, my stuff basically works pretty well. It gets a little quieter at night when it shuts down, but um, my, my well, we bought our a house from Nancy's family when her dad passed away. It's a little bitty house in North Carolina. We have a four kilowatt system there, and it's noisy as all get out. So I have to turn it off whenever I want to operate on HF. <clears throat> it's got panels right above me, right near my antenna, and the noise is usually on the input side of switching systems because they draw pulse current from their source for their switching. And the pulses generate huge RF. So <clears throat> what you have to do to fix it, and Mike would be willing to do this, you have to go in and put in a big filter. And one way to do it is a common mode filter is take both the wires plus and minus and run, run them as many times as you can through the biggest type 43 ferret you can buy, which is probably an FT240-43, which is about $9 each. But the wire is like number six wire. So it's gonna be some effort to do that. <clears throat> but that will probably quiet my noise by six dB, maybe 10, if I'm lucky. If you've got money and you don't mind spending it, 
then if you buy the MIF 23 filter, it's good to about 10 amps, and it's excellent. It's like 100 dB of isolation. Um, and if you put that in between your solar panels and your charge controller, you've got a much better chance, but it's money, and it's going to have to be installed. Um, so that's just one thing at one point. Yeah. But you will then also want to do the same thing on the output of the inverter before it goes to the house. So you've got to have filters at both ends, and you want to keep all the wires short, and you want to provide as much capacitance to the ground as you can so that it leaks off energy instead of radiating it from all this wiring. So my battery wires are four foot little antennas right underneath my ham radio station, because they're in the basement. And you might want to encase them in aluminum foil and ground it, or you know, I don't know what else. But it's, <clears throat> solar panel systems are just as bad, and it's quite an effort to solve them, because it's high current, really high current. And the same problem for, um, so there, there are no solutions for, you, for in, industrial installations. All of the pulse code modulated factory machines have exactly the same problem. But, and, and this is discussed in the paper that I didn't stick in the, uh, in the talk. But there are industrial filters that you can buy right off the shelf. You can get them on Amazon, you can get them on DigiKey, you can get them on Mouser. You can get them all the way up to like 200 amps at 480 volts, three phase if you want. I mean, they'll sell you something. And you got an electrician to go install them. Big box with a bunch of ferrites and things like that, capacitors on the inside. And you can quiet stuff down. And they should have done that at our EOC. But once the deed is done, they're not likely to go back and re-engineer it. So my concern is I gotta talk to them before they buy stuff for the new EOC. And they're talking about buying little UPSs for each room. So instead of just having one noise generator, I'm gonna have 20. <sighs> so I found little filters, consumer level filters for like 100 bucks each that are not a whole lot of them available, but if you put one on the input of every one of those UPSs, it's likely to make a huge improvement. And if you put one on the output, it's likely to really solve the problem too. So there are solutions, and it's in the paper that I wrote, and I got the, <clears throat> I found these things, they're hard to find, but uh, a couple of manufacturers make consumer level RF filters that are common mode and differential mode. They don't provide really good specs on them because it's con consumer level, but the words they use make me think you're probably getting 30 to 50 DB, and I'll take every DB I can get. Does that make, does that answer your question? We're gonna have to work hard. I got a ham radio friend and his neighbor put a solar panel in his wife's house. And unfortunately the hurricane tore up the guy's roof so they had to take all the panels off. And when they did, he went over and put a bunch of ferrite uh, apparently in each panel. On the wiring coming out from him. Yeah. Yeah. And that cost several hundred dollars. Yeah. Less, but uh, it worked, I bet. But it did work. Yeah, it might not be perfect because each the ferrites are if you you normally install those to get rid of common mode and you run both wires at the same time. So the currents that are supposed to be flowing are in opposite directions, right? It goes into and goes out. They see no inductance because their fields completely cancel. They don't saturate the ferrite, they don't see any inductance, it's just perfect. The thing that you're not supposed to have, the common mode where it's being an antenna, that sees inductance. And the FT240 and 43s are pretty good for that because dead gum, they're lossy above 10 megahertz and they're inductive below it. So they make really nice common mode filters. Um, and they're, they're only about nine bucks each if you get them from kits and parts here in Florida. Um, so that, that's one of the things to do. If you can, if you can coil, if I can get 11 turns through, I'm really happy, but the inductance goes up by the square of the turns. So going from two turns to four turns, you get four times the inductance. Going from four turns to eight turns, four more times, so now you're up to 16 times. So you wanna get as many turns as you can through that sucker. And the, the disadvantage to all this is we don't know what it does to the switching system of the charge controller, and those are expensive. So, I can't guarantee you that it won't 
you know, add heat, decrease efficiency, that sort of thing. I just don't know. But if the problem is acute enough, then you don't really care. I gotta get this fixed, right? Even if it blows the thing up, I gotta get this fixed. And blowing it up is one way of fixing it. Yeah, might not make you a better hero. <laughs> no. <laughs> but that's good that, that his neighbor let him do that. So you've got FCC on your side, right? Because if you're... Yeah, they don't respond to anything. If you, yeah, we could probably bring a civil action. If they're interfering with a licensed station, that's a problem. And you, you might be able to get an attorney to file civil action against your neighbor. I don't know if you'll win at it, but being polite to offer their help is probably better. This guy did a lot for two, three years. Just couldn't do anything else. I think he got blown out of LFCC. Nobody did anything. Until the hurricane, the wife said, oh, yeah, you have to do it. Either. either hurricane or a lawyer, one or the other. <laughs> But, but you know, and the differences. You have to wonder why these people. Why it was cheaper. <laughs> why why they're allowed to sell these solar panels without this protection? Well, I'm sure they tested them on an 80 centimeter table with a ground plane underneath and a long inductor, and oh, it passes. I, I was involved in a project where we were going into telephone offices. And, and retrofitting electromechanical offices with electronics. And so our subcontractor became the contractor for California because they had to certify they were earthquake proof. Mm -hmm. And we said, well, how are you gonna do that? He says, I'm getting a rubber stamp that says earthquake proof, <laughs> and I'm gonna stamp it on everything. <laughs> and, you know, our lawyers wouldn't let us anywhere near that, so they became the prime contractor. <laughs> no, you don't want to do that. I don't know why. But uh, uh, there are many ways to solve. Uh,